All right, great. Well, thank you all for uh, attending our event. Uh, this is the last lecture of our Art of Architecture lecture series. And for those of you who have not seen the prior lectures, they're now all on our YouTube channel. So if you go to uh, YouTube, we have a YouTube handle, MDPL1976. And you can see the lectures from Richard Heisenbottle, Kobe Karp, and Tuesday Studio. Uh, today, we're really excited to have uh, Urban Robot. Who here has heard of Urban Robot before? <laughs> All right, a lot of fans here. Um, Urban Robot is actually a design collective. And they're located in Miami Beach. And what's interesting about them is they do multidisciplinary design. So that includes landscape architecture, architecture, urban design, and interior design, which is something very unique. Um, and today's speaker is J.J. Wood, who is the founder and principal of Urban Robot Associates. And while attending Harvard, he specialized in researching urban economics and industrial districts, contributing original conjecture in the field of redevelopment through urbanized agriculture. And he's managed a lot of projects. We've seen some of them here, uh, including multifamily housing, mixed use architectural projects, and even commercial entertainment venues, which sounds delicious. Um, and uh, without further ado, let's welcome JJ. Thanks so much, Daniel. Real pleasure to be here. Thank you to the uh, MDPL for hosting this event and for inviting us to, uh, to participate. Uh, in particular, Daniel. We've worked with Daniel now for several years. And, um, you know, he's running a campaign, a donation campaign, in case anyone missed it. So they're looking to make sure that they can reach their numbers. So there's a shameless plug now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I forgot about it. We are a multidisciplinary firm, Urban Robot Associates, as Daniel mentioned. Um, we specialize in architecture, interiors, and landscape architecture. So we get to have a different take on a lot of different uh, spaces and places in Miami Beach. And one of the, one of the joys of working in Miami Beach uh, is that we, we get to really think about uh, the DNA of Miami Beach. And that's really what we're interested in across the board, all disciplines, we're kind of interested in what makes Miami Beach such a special place. Uh, not just from, a design, uh, from an architecture point of view, but from a landscape architecture and interiors point of view as well. So uh, I've got four different uh, projects that I think exemplify that exploration into the DNA of Miami Beach. Uh, Cascades, Time Out Market, uh, 29 Indian Creek, and One Hotel Beach Club, which are uh, sort of the, diff the different disciplines. So you'll see some of the, the themes that we like to explore and that we're looking to explore in our work. So Cascades was a project that uh, was brought to us uh, about 10 years ago now. In, in 2013, so coming up on 10 years. And uh, it was an interesting project because it was a two-story structure with a roof deck that was designed by Melvin Grossman, who is uh, one of uh, Morris Lapidus' protégés. Uh, and it's actually one of the earliest structures that he designed here on Miami Beach. And it was a, sort of a post-war structure. It's not quite a garden, uh, a garden, uh, garden hotel typology. Uh, it was kind of a proto version of that. So you can see the original structure uh, on the bottom left. And of course, what we did was add an addition to the top, rooftop addition. And that, that addition was meant to uh, obviously complement the architecture from the ground, the, the lower two floors, and kind of step back and be sort of very neutral. But what we were interested in exploring was this idea that the past and the present can kind of collaborate and they can kind of accentuate each other. So. You can see on the bottom left that uh, that image sort of shows there's a very sort of staid, it's a monolithic kind of uh, structure. That's a view of the roof deck on the upper left. Um, and so, of course, you can also see the, the idea that we're starting to explore here, which is integrate landscape uh, into the building volumes and into the structures uh, in a very meaningful way. So the idea was that the veil, there's a, there's a planted veil on the roof. So the roof deck kind of incorporates this planted element that sort of comes down and actually further disguises the additional story that was added. In this project, we were also kind of interested in exploring the idea that uh, buildings are not, as much as we can, we want to preserve buildings and work with buildings and work with the internal order of buildings 
and not just keep facades in place. Even though that is partially what we ended up doing because the structure here was a wooden structure and we have to meet today's codes and deal with the sea level rise and all of that. But this is sort of a, an early exploration into what it means to work with, with buildings and keeping buildings rather than pieces of buildings, um, which is unfortunately a lot of times what we end up uh, having to deal with some of those realities. So this is sort of a, a proto version of which we get further into in Indian Creek and a further project we kind of get to explore a little more in depth. On the interior side, we also get to have a lot of fun with, with different spaces in Miami Beach uh, because there are, we feel that the history of Miami Beach and that DNA of Miami Beach and that thread of past and uh, kind of informing the present is not just something that influences the architecture, right? So in Time Out Market, what we did was we went through a, a, a kind of a deep exploration into a lot of the different materials that are meaningful for Miami Beach. So terrazzo is, is a very meaningful substance here. It was used historically in the absence of stone. It was meant to kind of uh, be almost like a substitute for stone. The floors here are terrazzo. And it's a colored aggregate and a pigmented concrete, uh, a pigment in, in, the, um, in the fly ash that basically uh, creates this sort of beautiful concrete that can kind of be poli you know, polished down and becomes a very uh, meaningful substance, especially in Miami Beach with the amount of colors. So we went through a series of explorations to really kind of discover the, the, the perfect pink, if you will. And that became these sort of monolithic uh, slabs that contribute to the, to the food theater, which is really what Time Out Market was trying to do. And so the black and the pink are kind of classic uh, Miami Beach um, colors. And the materials here were just sort of really meant to kind of have a touch of vintage and a touch of reference to the past, but to have something very contemporary. The idea of having these very monolithic, beautifully lit terrazzo counters is something that is something is very contemporary. So the space is sort of this, uh, almost like a cathedral to food, right? And if you go into the space, it's still a very neutral, a lot of the finishes, a lot of the materials are very neutral. And they're kind of set back, uh, you know, from the, from the main event, which is really the food theater and the people that are in the space. So 29 Indian Creek, this is a, a, very, a recent project that we're working through now um, to, to uh, kind of work through and get our permits and have it constructed. 29 Indian Creek is quite an interesting project uh, from, a, from a, again, this idea that the past sort of matters, the DNA matters, the history matters of where we are. And all along Indian Creek, so we started our analysis of looking at the, the context and the location, and all along Indian Creek, you have today these sort of two, three, four story structures, historic structures that are all facing Indian Creek. And on, on our site, um, the development of our site followed kind of a, a strange pattern, <clears throat> which was that in 1936, there was an original structure designed by Shopel and Southwell. It's a quite a beautiful structure, and the, it, was, it was kind of put into the northwest corner of the site facing south because that south uh, parcel was, the building was kind of meant to be appreciated from that southerly view to have this sort of front garden. In 1938, the owners of the site uh, built an addition, uh, built a small structure uh, next, to the, next to the original 1936 structure. Again, they were respecting that sort of view, that kind of site plan that basically was allowing them to face south so that the front of the, clearly the front of the building is this sort of U-shaped beautiful courtyard with these very expressive stairs that kind of go up uh, facing south. And then in 1962, post-war, uh, there was this garden style apartment building that was kind of built um, in front of this structure and kind of blocked the view and kind of sealed it in the original two structures of the site. So our client came to us and said, you know, can we, what can we do with the site? We actually got the site developed and approved for development in 2014. And then Indian Creek underwent a whole series of um, raising of the road. This is just sort of another shot of that 1958 condition and, and 2020 condition. So ultimately, um, Indian Creek, they had to raise the road because of sea level rise. 
And this presented a, a problem for what we had originally designed and gotten approved because we couldn't raise the 1962 structure that was on the corner. It was not in good shape and it was kind of not raisable. After a whole series of analyses and looking at, this, at the historic structure, uh, the original 1936 structure, this is an elevation of that 36 structure, we, we sort of looked at what the impact would be to raise the site or where Indian Creek was and um, Indian Creek was raised enough so that it was going to basically flood our property. These are sort of some of the diagrams that we looked at in terms of what we would have to do. So really the only way to kind of celebrate and save this structure was to effectively raise it and turn it and rotate it and have it facing Indian Creek. And the idea here is that following the Buoyant City guidelines, which had come out prior to this project, the idea was to take the existing structure, that existing historic stock that was originally meant to be sort of viewed from the south to sort of see that main elevation and actually bring it back to its main elevation, which was now along Indian Creek, rather than the side street of 29th Street, which was not being raised. So with that, we could actually celebrate the structure by raising it, making it more sort of visible from the street and kind of bringing back the kind of grand glory of this structure that was sealed in by this kind of post-war structure, which was not a, was not a great example of garden style architecture. It was not a great example of post-war architecture. It wasn't a great example of, of, of um, a lot of the, there, there are better examples on Miami Beach, frankly. So this one, the idea here was to rotate it and, and raise it, which this was the first project that was approved uh, unanimously by the HPB that sort of voluntarily takes it upon itself to adopt the Boynton City guidelines and raise the structure and put it in a better place on the site and kind of give this historic structure a new life, which frankly we think was giving it the life that it always was supposed to have. Uh, again, just kind of doing that analysis of the site plan. So these are some of the Bullion City guidelines um, that were adopted. We were in a zone where the recommendation from these guidelines were, were to raise this particular structure. We decided to go the extra mile of rotating the structure and bringing it back to that sort of Indian Creek presence. And then of course, the problem becomes, what do you do with the rest of the site? And how do you sort of meld the contemporary architecture that we're interested in exploring with this building that has sort of taken over and become the main piece of the site? And what's interesting in this area, in the Collins Waterfront Historic District, is that you have sort of east of Collins, you have these interesting structures, these larger structures that are much more expressive of a, of a nautical modern, modern, right? They have, you have the Fontainebleau, they have these large curves, these large beautiful curves, and they have these interesting horizontal banding. And so those larger structures sort of happen in a, in a, on the east side. And then on the west side of Collins, you end up with these more uh, historic, smaller scale walk-up typology, whether it's a mix of MIMO or Art Deco or post-war uh, kind of garden style um, structures. So the idea, you can see on the bottom sort of diagram, the idea was once you rotate this historic structure, you actually end up with a very strong axis and a very strong expression because it is all about kind of that internal courtyard. And so the building behind it needs to function almost like a backdrop to that historic structure. It needs to respond to the larger scale sort of curvatures that are expressive of that area. And it needs to kind of find a home in the horizontal kind of banding uh, that you see that is so sort of Art Deco, so, so key to Art Deco, right? So a lot of this horizontal banding, we, we figured we would explore in terms of alternating, alternating the balconies and kind of rotating the floor plates. So it's sort of a, an implied symmetry, but it happens on, on different levels. And so this is the elevation that you get on Indian Creek because you take the historic structure and you raise it and rotate it and then you kind of have this implied symmetry of this very beautiful sort of backdrop to the historic structure, which is at the pedestrian scale, which is now 
a tremendous investment for the client. <clears throat> They're going to basically restore this building. Uh, we're obviously restoring all the windows. We're you know restoring the roof, but we're able to kind of cut the building from its foundation, raise it, rotate it, and put it on site, and then integrate with the now raised street. So it's really we're we're quite pleased with um, this idea because we get to again we're sort of in keeping with Indian Creek on the lower scale and we get to really explore the, the impact of raising historic structures and finding creative ways to have our clients understand the investment in historic structures is very worthwhile because that really is part of the, the story. And of course the structure in the back as, as well, that's not something that you would see in Chicago, that's not something that you would see in New York that's something that's very Miami Beach. And maybe it's a little sort of ephemeral, you can't quite put your finger on it why it is, but it's it got a lot of these elements. It's got the sort of large curving, large curves, it's got the, the banding, it kind of functions as a brise for the for the structure, for the glass. It's very simple uh, and it's very horizontal. So one of the, our, the last discipline that I want to talk about is landscape architecture, and I'm not a landscape architect, but I can appreciate what our landscape architects do. And they also get to kind of explore this idea of the DNA of Miami Beach, the past influencing the present, and taking cues from the past to kind of inform the story so that there's something that is very appropriate in the, in the, the, the design continuum, let's say, of Miami Beach, right? But they kind of get to do things a little bit in reverse, in the sense that so for the One Hotel Beach Club, what we were asked to do was design uh, uh, a beach club that felt natural and almost like the beach club had been there before the One Hotel. So the landscape architects get to work a lot with um, a lot of native species and they get to work with a lot of um, a plant palette, let's say, that's very dune-based. And the idea here was to effectively extend the dune so that there was very little differentiation between uh, the sort of natural landscape that you would see on the dune and this you know incredible natural landscape that you would want to actually inhabit and ends up being a beach club so uh, again the idea is to sort of work within the order of the place rather than impose an order that has no no it doesn't make any sense to kind of impose that order it's no one we're not interested in fitting you know, square pegs into round holes. We'd rather put round holes, uh, round pegs into round holes, right? So, and that kind of, that theme, from a very simple point of view, sort of finds its way, again, into the landscape. So this is meant to be a landscape that is natural. Um, again, we do have to deal with things like sea level rise and things like flooding. So the extension of the dune is a, is a, is a, is a very complex uh, element. There are a lot of elements that are uh, kind of small. We had to raise the idea was to raise the, the landscape as well, to raise the space so that you could kind of feel like you were out in that part of that dune. And it's quite a magical space because it's a, it's a very natural landscape and it's a very uh, expressive landscape that gets to actually set the tone for what it means to have something that is sustainable, what it means to have something that's a, that's a sort of natural plant palette. A lot of times I think myself included, we tend to think that beautiful colors, you know, are the only thing that make a landscape beautiful, and a lot of those exotics don't do well. So the idea here is you can actually create quite a beautiful landscape with the natural palette that you have available. You just need to kind of be able to work within that order and pay attention to what the space is telling you. So that's really, that's really the, the idea that we're kind of interested in exploring is sort of listening to history. We like to say that we like to tell stories by, by making places. Uh, and that's something that we kind of like to explore across all disciplines. And um, so those are some of the projects we've been working on. So I believe there's time for questions and answers. If anyone has any questions, I guess I can just hand you the mic. In one of your photos, uh, you belong in the Indian Creek, the 1962 structure. Uh, 
that one on the bottom right. That looks like a mid-century structure uh, uh, that we would appreciate today. I'm just wondering who the architect was and how did you get permission to remove it? So uh, the architect was not, we could not find out who the architect was. There was no record of who the architect was. The, the structure that really sort of mattered was the 1936 structure. That's the, the, the Schopel and Southwell structure. The, the post-war, the garden apartments here were, the structure was compromised. There was concrete that was falling. Uh, the foundation was not doing too well. <clears throat> there had been some intrusion, uh, some water intrusion over the years through the roof. And it was not going to, so our fear was that if we had raised that structure, it was going to crumble. And we felt that this was part of what we presented to the board and what the board was willing to, was willing to accept was this kind of compromise in the sense that the board was saying, look, if we can demolish the structure that doesn't, isn't exemplary in order to allow for the development of a structure that is exemplary, we're okay with that. And it was, um, it was not an easy idea. We did a lot of research into, into that structure and how we could uh, save it. it was, so it was built at a time, the, the, the concrete was, was not good. There was, spe there was speculation that they had mixed sand into the concrete, which happened in a lot of older structures. So in 62, we didn't think that they would have done that. That's more something that happens in the 30s and 40s. <clears throat> but it turned out that the, the structure was just not doing very well. And the, the, in that particular corner, it was compounded by the fact that, the, that Indian Creek was raised on that corner by enough, by about three feet, and there was no way to, to raise that building and move it of, and, and have it be a meaningful impact. It was always going to flood. And that was also a concern, um, you know, to the city because they, they've invested quite a bit on Indian Creek and they didn't want to see any of these historic properties flood. So, uh, or at least, you know, kind of mitigate that impact. On the, on the previous HPB application, we had gotten permission to demolish uh, about half the structure. And so we kind of came back and said, look, sadly, you know, it's not doing too well, so. So, in other words, you had to produce an engineer's report? Yeah. Oh, yeah, engineer. oh, yeah. It was... The other engineer's opinion was compromised. Right, <laughs> right. And it's also, so it was, it was an engineer, I mean, structural engineers involved, construction experts involved. Uh, the, uh, Kim Brownie, the guy who moves, the, who's going to end up moving the structure, has moved structures from Long, I mean, the guy has a history of moving structures. He works out of Long Island and now he works in, in the Keys. And he also was saying, look, the, I don't think I can move this. And, and, that, and so then we looked, okay, can we build around it? Can we raise it? Can we, uh, with all the amount of, of intervention that we would have to do, it wouldn't even look like itself anymore. And so at that point we thought, okay, you know, Let's focus on the one that, that you can't even see today. You know, that's really the one that has a lot of beautiful elements. I have a question. Yeah. So the two that, that you're, well, are you just moving the one structure? Yes, just the one that's, okay. yeah. So in the process of getting that approved, like why, um, this is more of like a, Devil's advocate for question. Why didn't you just decide to demolish that one? And could you talk a little bit about the process of getting approval to demolish the other two? Sure. So the process of getting the approval is you have to put together a whole series of uh, engineering reports, uh, analysis, historical analysis, historic resources reports. Um, so there's the opinion of historians, there's the opinion of professional architects, there's prof the opinion of professional engineers. And, uh, yeah, and that goes as an application to the city. The city itself, all the experts at the city, also look at the project, and then city staff renders an opinion, and then it goes to the HPB. And the HPB can approve, deny, 
you know, they, they have all the authority to basically accept or, or deny the project based on, based on the merits. Um, so we went through a process of all that analysis, all, 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 the, all the, you know, in, in detail um, understanding of what we were asking. We gave a presentation to the city and the city uh, basically approved it. Uh, it was actually unanimous, unanimously approved. I think mostly because of the, the fact that nobody even understood that there was a beautiful historic structure kind of sealed into the corner. So it was, a, it was as I say, it was, it was a trade-off that, that, you know, um, and so that decision became, okay, if we're gonna, if we're gonna say that, let's not, let's not design a building around it and seal it back in. Why would we, if we're gonna raise it, why would we, it didn't feel like the right thing to do for that structure. So we said, let's, let's rotate it. It actually makes sense to put it on Indian Creek where you can see it, where ev any pedestrian can see it. I mean, I think this, this elevation sort of highlights that fact. I mean, you can, that historic structure is now, it, it has a presence in the public realm, right? It's contributing to that fabric along Indian Creek, which is, it's appropriate for Indian Creek because that is the, right next door we have a historic structure that's three stories, and further up the street we have two and three story structures. So it felt like it was continuing that, you know, sort of presence on Indian Creek. And then the structure in the back kind of fades into the back, and it's less, um, it still has views over the historic, sure, but um, it's, it's about the composition of the past and the present kind of working together. That was, that was what we were really interested in. Yes? It looks because of the economic impact. I mean, clearly, all that can be made to the property without that building is probably not enough to warrant the work. Right. And it's hoping that that, that building is going to pay for it. Effectively, yes. The idea is if the client can, can develop the property in such a manner that the historic building is an asset, is something to be celebrated, then th that's also part of the showcase here, is that... So did this change the bar? Did this change the... The bar, the ratio? No, no, no. It, it, that never changes. We are always locked into the FAR no matter which version we do. So, so the contributing structure counts as FAR. Yeah, we can't, we can't, uh, that's not the code. We can't change the FAR. So basically, what it does do is that it allows, again, what's interesting is that it was a voluntary decision by the client to spend the money to rotate that and raise that building. And it was doable because we could develop the property and so everything kind of came together. The client, it was a win-win for e everybody. The client was happy, the city was happy, we were happy, we get to save a piece of fantastic architecture that nobody could see. And um, so, yes? Did the client uh, envision that this building could be turned? No. We, we, Sometimes we have crazy ideas, and this was a crazy idea. We said, why don't we just, maybe we should rotate it, and, and we're gonna, we have to raise it anyway. Why don't we just rotate it? it may, and so all of that kind of started to come together, and we said, yeah, actually, that, that makes a lot of sense. So the difficulties of rotating a historic building are, are not to be underestimated. We're still going through that process of figuring out how, we have to lock the structure in, it is, it's, it's quite complex. But um, we have a very good chance of getting it done. It's, we're in the process of going through the permitting now you know, with the city. And um, it was part of, it was part of the, that it's part of how we design, is that we kind of look at even the quote unquote crazy options. And sometimes they, they work for, for everybody. Any other questions?
Very well, thank you so much. Thank you.